Good afternoon. It's a tough crowd, tough crowd. What a, uh, what a great morning. Um, we have a keynote speaker for the second half of lunch here. And uh, this keynote speaker, I think, has a tough act to follow after Jonathan Kraft, who I think did a phenomenal job talking about the New England Patriots and making the uh, often unthought about correlation between, between data-driven management of a professional football team and, and energy management. I thought he did an outstanding job of that. And thanks to all of uh, the participants in the breakout sessions this morning. I think that was uh, enlightening uh, content. And uh, what, a, what a great way to kick off the conference. We, uh, for any, any demand response providers out in the audience that have facilities in Allegheny Power Service Territory, we're, uh, we have an event starting in half an hour. So we've been dispatched in PJM in Allegheny's uh, service territory. So make sure uh, the, the, the crew back at the, at the site's aware of that, which I'm sure they are. And um, as, a, as a shameless plug, um, there is in something called Enternock U, which most people, you're just looking at your agenda, you're seeing the, the breakout sessions. On the last page of your agenda sheets, which were in your bags, there's a, a schedule for Enernoc U. And I encourage everyone to participate in that, at least in some of those sessions, because I think that'll be really, uh, really valuable for, for both sides. And in that, we're doing some customer focus groups. Uh, we're doing some product demos, uh, some product training. And I think it'll be a great opportunity to also see what's coming down the pike in terms of new features and functionality in our applications. So I encourage everybody to, to look at that schedule and to, uh, to participate in some, of the, in some of those sessions. So in January of this year, uh, the Securities and Exchange Commission issued guidance on disclosure related to greenhouse gas emissions and climate change. And with the rapidly evolving regulatory landscape and increasing globalization of businesses and a tangle of voluntary and mandatory reporting requirements that are unraveling, it's no wonder that many public companies look for a guide, for a, for a, for a source of information that can help them navigate this often mystifying landscape. And for many people, that guide is Sahir Sermeli. Sa is co-chair of Mintz Levin's Energy and Clean Technology Practice Group. Um, that group serves over 200 clients in energy and the clean tech field. Sa is a graduate from the University of Chicago Booth School of Business and also the University of Chicago Law School. SA regularly represents emerging and established energy companies, clean tech companies, and information technology firms in public offerings and private financings. He serves on the Innovation Task Force with the New England Clean Energy Council and also um, is a member of the MIT Energy Club. So please join me in welcoming our friend, SA. Thanks, Sam. I appreciate it. Thanks, David, and thanks everyone for having me. It's a, it's a privilege to be here at the uh, first Energy Smart Conference. Uh, I'm looking forward to many more for years to come. Uh, I've, I've uh, had the pleasure of working with the Enernoc team for six years since I moved here to Boston, and uh, it's been a real privilege to uh, work with Tim Healy, David Brewster, Greg Dixon, Terry Sick, David Samuels, so many people, the list has expanded over the years, Tim Weller, Darren Brady. But throughout the organization, it, it, it's just a, a fantastic team. Everyone I've worked with on the team is, is driven, passionate, and relentless. It's about execution uh, for the customers, and I'm glad to be on the team, so thank you. I'm going to give you a brief overview of uh, the uh, what's going on at the SEC with respect to compliance matters and climate change. There's a, there's a good deal happening there, um, and I'm only going to touch on sort of high-level matters to see what's going on so we can have some level of what to think about there. But I guess first thing I'd like to do is put forth a, a proposal for uh, solving climate change. Uh, I'm hopeful that this isn't where we're going to be in 50 years. Uh, I'm hopeful that people in this room are going to be able to do something about the business and to be able to, to uh, uh, help that evolve. It, it's great to see the evolution of uh, energy management and demand response uh, over the last five or six years. And I think we'll continue to see that evolution. As, uh, as uh, FERC Chairman Wellinghoff was saying last night, uh, 
demand response and energy efficiency need to be our first line actions when it comes to energy, not our alternative options, not our backup plans. And I think that's very meaningful coming from uh, those levels at the federal government, and I think we're going to see more about that uh, as it comes. The, the first thing I'd like to do is just give you a basic framework of the SEC disclosure uh, uh, regime. The, the SEC's uh, relationships with companies and public companies basically functions around one principle, disclosure, disclosure, disclosure. What they want is they want companies to provide investors with material information about the business, about the operations and risks related to the company, and let investors make informed decisions about buying, holding, and selling the stock based on this material information. So the question then becomes, what information is material? Information is considered material uh, at the SEC if there's a substantial likelihood that a reasonable investor would consider the information important in deciding how to vote or make an investment decision. So that means that companies have to talk about things that are important to investors. In the, in the 70s and 80s, the SEC uh, adapt, uh, uh, enacted some specific requirements with respect to what that means as it relates to matters regarding the environment. So what they said in those uh, regulations, and that now applies to all public companies and has for over 20 years, is that you have to talk about the effects of compliance uh, with respect to matters relating to the environment and how it impacts your capex, how it impacts your earnings and competitive position. You've got to provide very specific information, two years of capex uh, information as it relates to environmental. It's actually uh, for the remainder of your current year as well as the full uh, uh, next year and any subsequent periods to the extent that it's material. You've got to talk about risks, environmental related lit risks and litigation, and you've got to talk about trends and what you're seeing out there uh, that might make the uh, future results of the business unlike your historical results. So that's the existing framework that's been out there uh, for many years. And there's really been a, a drumbeat of calls for more specific details on climate change related matters. And that really started uh, seven or uh, eight years ago, but ramped up about five years ago. The, 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 the first big publication to come out on it was a, something called the Global Framework for Climate Risk Disclosure. That was put out by a, a group of institutional investors and climate change advocates and made a call for, on companies to disclose specific emissions data to provide a strategic analysis of climate risk and emissions management to assess physical risks from climate change and to do an analysis of the regulatory risk. If you listen to what they're saying, they're saying we want companies to look inward and start assessing this stuff. We want you to provide detailed information. This is all the way back in 2006. That's at the same time that uh, uh, California's uh, Assembly Bill 32 was passed. Uh, that calls for and sets greenhouse gas emission reduction standards for California uh, over the coming years. That's actually currently under attack. Uh, in 2007, uh, another large group of investors petitioned the SEC for uh, additional disclosure uh, from public companies. Um, that included CalPERS, so we're not talking about small players. Significant institutional investors are, are calling for this information. In 2007, uh, never publicity shy, the New York State Attorney General uh, subpoenaed a number of energy companies uh, and claimed that they were uh, misleading investors and inadequately disclosing the uh, uh, impact of climate risk on their businesses. So, uh, and there were a number of settlements on those over the years and, the, and, the settle, and the, over the next couple of years. And those settlements uh, were very close to, the, to the, uh, the, the, the companies agreed to provide information that's very close to the global framework. They, they agreed to disclo disclose, excuse me, risk from climate change regulations and litigation, uh, financial risk from the physical impacts of climate change, uh, strategic, to provide a strategic analysis of climate change risk, and uh, emissions management, and also to provide uh, information on their current carbon emissions and their projected increase in carbon emissions. Uh, 
uh, in, in June of 2009, an, an even larger group uh, representing more than a, a trillion dollars of assets called on the SEC again. And uh, in the middle of 2009, there were reports that the SEC was uh, finally engaging with uh, these investors to hear out uh, why they wanted more specific information than was already called for out there. And then in um, end of January, as David said, but uh, ultimately effective February 2, 2010, the SEC's guidance came out on public company disclosures relating to climate change. Prior to the guidance uh, in February, uh, companies were providing some guidance and information on this, uh, but there wasn't a lot going on. Uh, most of it was going on in Europe, where the regulatory landscape was changing quicker than in the United States, and the U.S. was really lagging. Um, there was some data that there was additional disclosure in the, do in, in the filings, uh, but uh, it didn't really ramp up until 2009. Uh, and it ramped up in different ways. The, the, uh, the Carbon Disclosure Project is one of numerous uh, investor and advocate groups that calls on companies to provide information about their carbon emissions. It actually goes beyond that. They call for information on what you're doing about your water risk and other risks as well as they relate to the environment. And there's a couple things to take away from the data here. First, the, the, the European companies, again, were, are way ahead on the disclosure. Uh, second, I take with a grain of salt some of the reporting information here based on some of the other data we're going to see. Um, but third is that this is the S&P 500. It's showing that these, the, the, the companies with the most resources were just getting beyond the 50% level when it came to providing information on climate change and, and greenhouse gas emissions. And then when you look down the list, and I think this is the most important takeaway from it, you realize that there's data being provided, but as you go down to the more uh, important levels of engagement, the, the percentages drop. So the percentage of companies where there's board engagement or executive engagement in this is, uh, is lower. And if you go beyond that, you see companies actually setting emissions reductions targets, which, which are all coming at one point or another. Is even